Well, hi, Richard. How are you? I'm good. I'm living the coaching dream, as always. As so, always. As always. Always good in the kingdom of coaches is Sully Run Yes, Yeah, the pearl yeah, of the well, most. Absolutely. Well, congratulations, first of all, for uh, becoming the chairman of RHA Coaches, um, which we've had a keen interest in since it launched, of course, as you'll well know. Absolutely. Um, and uh, was it was it a job you were angling after, or was it uh, was it kind of offered? Tell me how that happened. It was done on a voting process by um, the coach forum that's been formed. I put myself forward for the coach forum. Uh, as everybody knows, I've been um, involved in RHA since the um, the start, from the beginnings, the early beginnings. Um, so I'm considered a founder member. Um, realistically, no, it wasn't a post that was particularly chasing. It was something that I just said, look, if you guys think I can add value, I'm quite happy to do it. But likewise, I'm not going to be offended if there's somebody else within the membership that we feel can drive it forward on another angle. So I was always open on that idea. Um, it wasn't something that I intended, oh, I've got to be the chairman, far from it. But I'm deeply honoured that I've been selected for it in the same time. So, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. I mean, you've championed the cause of RHA, of course. Um... Uh, since its inception um, and also championed the cause of trade associations I think as well. Yeah absolutely I think and you know we've seen over the last 24 months the issues that we've had with Covid for instance the pandemic that's brought a lot of things with the industry to the forefront and what we quickly realised with the pandemic was the industry was chronically under uh, represented the message wasn't getting out there of what coaches do, do. And likewise, a lot of operators couldn't actually pin the tail on the donkey and say, what does a coach operator do? Come out with that. So if we couldn't explain, how did we expect MPs to know? So the important thing is certainly we need them uh, voices within Parliament. We need um, them trade bodies and they need to be strong uh, trade bodies as well. And they need to add value to your company. Now, at the moment, we've got three trade bodies and three very good trade bodies. They all suit a purpose. And what I would say to anybody is, is look what each one's offering. Look if it suits your business model, what it can deliver for your company. Because there's two, I say there's two strands with trade bodies. Firstly, you want them to campaign on a national level. You want them to get the message across. You want them to defend the coach industry and fight for what's right, influence change. But likewise, you need things that will help you day-to-day -day running as well, how it can help your operation. So for me, the facilities that I get to RHA first class um, perhaps if I offered a, operated a load of bus services, CPT would be the way forward for me. So it's making sure you get that fit. It's like a gym membership and you've got to make sure it's got the right equipment for your operation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, while we're talking about that, um, what is the right equipment as far as RHA coaches is concerned? You have a, you have a regional structure, I think, don't you, at uh, RHA coaches? So what, what happens with our RHA coaches is a subdivision of the RHA that's collectively got 8,500 members. Now, the coach division is obviously a much, it's a much smaller industry. We're getting near on 100 members of the, uh, of the coach sector, which is some good going in just over 12 months of operation. So we have our own coach forum, which is uh, elected members that are part of our membership that form a, uh, a, for, form a forum of 12 in total i think it's a maximum of 12 i think we're up to 11 and we've got a real good mix as well of operators length and breadth of the country different size of operation all can bring something different different viewpoints because it's no good everybody singing off the same hymn sheets and everybody going along with the same ideas it's great to be challenged it's great to have alternate views and we've got a nice little mix so we've also got more ad milligan and we've got alistair bayliss who were the vice chairs of the organization two fantastic operators in their own right. Then you've got the likes of Kerry Taylor, Danny Henshaw. Um, there's various others, too many to mention at the moment. But yeah, I think we've got a great little group, which is a good think tank. And we're working with a very proactive organization, which in turn then we can take something from their meetings, pass that over to our HA and drive it forwards. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had similar conversations before, but it, it does always seem to me that actually, um, although it may not see the most comfortable fit with uh, a, a, an organisation that um, represents the haulage industry, actually in terms of the rules we all operate under and uh, as, as the coach industry, um, there, there are more similarities than differences, aren't there? Absolutely. There was, 
at the very start, there was obviously uh, quite a few operators a little bit sceptical. What could RHA offer that other organisations couldn't? But then we look at it and we look at the bare bones, the operation tests, DVLA access. Many of these things are exactly the same. And then RHA actually had a number of staff that had a real history in coaches and in bus operations that have come from training stagecoach employees from mechanical backgrounds. So the infrastructure was partly there anyway. We just needed to add on some um, extra people, which became in Andy, Andy Warrender joined us, which is fantastic. Excellent acquisition to the, sorry, acquisition is probably the wrong word. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent member to join us, you know, um, real, per, you know, great person to steer it forward. Andy is a top guy, and I think he's very well respected in the coach industry, got abundance of knowledge. So to have Andy working alongside such notables at um, RHA, as Paul Alera, who's our technical director, who's Paul's history in anything mechanical has absolutely amazed and outstanded me and the things that he's done when running fleets of trucks and when he previously worked in buses to make them little marginal savings and efficiency savings to get the best mpg out of vehicles is absolutely amazing running vehicles on nitrogen in the tires and what he's tried over the years i think is 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 fantastic um but we forget as well is uh, haulage they actually you know trucks drink fuel they seem to just drink it straight away so the haulage industry has always been very very sensitive to fine margins because they operate at a very um small profit margin as well so all them little efficiency savings can make a big difference so i found that of great in interest so there's so many um synergies uh, we could go to hr it doesn't matter if you're working in the haulage sector or if you're working in coaches that's there that's part of your membership you've got a hr line there is so many bits that were already there that we just had to add a little bit of speciality to and we were up and running and then since then i think there's eight members of um the, the all together i think there's 15 regional managers so uh, one of the claims of our ha is you never know normally more than an hour away from a regional manager which is really good um out of them 15 managers and the staff, which I think the staff is near, near on about 120. We've had eight recently that have done their CPC in transport management in PSV, which I think is really good. And that shows a commitment as well. So um, that gives them a greater understanding of the coaching industry. It shows that RHA is certainly not here for just a short time. They're in it for the long haul. And it's how we can drive collectively now, drive both industries forward. Yeah, yeah. Similarities also, of course, in uh, driver's hours and all, all of that within the haulage industry. So uh, I, I can see, of course, that, that they've amassed a lot of expertise as well in, um, in fending off uh, attacks on access to cities, haven't they, with um, CAZ and the like. So um, that'll they, be useful to the coach industry going forward. They've done a tremendous amount of work on these emission zones that have been set up and they have, have won for their members some major concessions. That can only be good for coach operators. It gives them time to plan ahead. We know that net zero is not going to go away, but if it's a more graduated approach and also the powers of B, be these metro mayors, these devolved government understand the issues that the coach industry faces and the haulage industry will hopefully see something that more fitting that operators can prepare better for rather than just having something thrown at you another set of rules this is what's going to apply irrespective in december 2023 and you've just got to run with it so yeah they've had some major wins on on that side there's still a lot of work to do we're engaging all the time Tomorrow evening, I'm with some of the chaps from RHA and Backhouse Jones, and we're meeting Andy Burnham. We're at an evening with Andy Burnham. So it'd be nice in a more social environment to have a little bit of a chat with him as well. A few weeks ago, I engaged with Steve Rotherham's office, and again, that was with the RHA. And that was very interesting. Their approach to Merseyside City region in how they're going to work with hydrogen and electric. And maybe because they're a haulage hub as well and a major port, they're really looking at hydrogen as well. And they're introducing some hydrogen buses. So we're seeing there, they're looking at a real mix of technology. So it's good to get these dialogue and these discussions going from the very start, rather than waiting, being reactive, 
being proactive because you can influence change from the very start. And one of the things I've always thought with the emission zone in London is the coach industry in particular only reacted when the change come. There was never a period of trying to maybe educate um, whoever the mayor of London was at the time to explain when these things, when, when these were just proposals to show the actual benefits that a coach can make. So the regulations come in and once once the horse has already bolted, it's very hard to do anything about it. Yeah. yeah. If we would have courted them from the start, maybe some concessions could have been seen for coaches because it is a very clean form of transport still. We know the, the figures that are always branded about it. It's 49 seat coach takes off around roughly 15 family cars. So that's making a major difference to the environment just based on the Euro 6 vehicle. But now we have the crazy scenario that we're driving into London. We're in these Euro 6 vehicles, but there's nowhere to park. So you're burning more diesel up driving around and around. And it's just a shame at the very start we couldn't get that sort of engagement. And that's not putting figures to anybody. It's just... I just think it's much easier to influence when you're involved in the discussions at the start rather than something's firmed up and then you're trying to change because you find it's not fit for purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, it's getting that message across, isn't it, that coaches are the solution to the problem of congestion and pollution rather than the problem themselves. And it, it was quite gratifying, I thought, during the um, uh, during the Queen's funeral that uh, the instruction went out to dignitaries across the world that they were to use the... Um, coaches provided to take them um, to and from the venue so it just goes to show that um, you know the message does get through and people do realize that um, you know that uh, coaches can resolve a congestion and a people movement problem um, very easily and very flexibly. Absolutely most of the biggest events that have happened in the country coaches are always the backbone of it they yeah. form part of the passenger logistics with its festivals with its events where dignitaries as you've just mentioned coaches form such a part of it and we just need to make sure that we're shouting that from the rooftops not being shy about what we represent what we can do and the difference that we can make yeah absolutely i mean at the moment of course just to change in tax slightly um this industry is not alone in fact i think businesses across the country must be um, petrified of uh, what's going to happen when uh, energy bills begin to rocket upwards and you see stories of pubs with projected £35,000 energy bills um, which clearly for small businesses like that would be unaffordable and of course the government has uh, has stepped in now and we do know that they're um, looking at ways in which they can mitigate kind of half the energy costs for companies now I'm just wondering how how power hungry um, in terms of energy in terms of energy in terms of gas and electricity are um, coach operations. Our particular operation is uh, our heating system is kerosene based, so uh, I'm quite fortunate that it still is. While the cost of kerosene has gone up, it's certainly not gone across the unit cost for electricity. The proposed rates. So in that respect, our heating largely unaffected. The electricity costs, my fixed term contract had actually just come to end, um, end of October and negotiating my new one. We're looking at about two and a half times as much, uh, the charge that we were yeah. paying beforehand. So, yeah, it's a substantial increase. Yeah. Um, depending on the operator, depending where they're situated, they may not have access to kerosene, may not have access to gas. It may be purely electric, maybe purely um, the heating is purely gas it's considerable costs and ultimately you've got to pass it over to the end user as well and that then forces inflation and we see that we see that with the crisis with fuel the costs how much it gone up from one pound ten a litre to excluding vat to 150s the higher 150s only a month or two ago it's been it's been quite frightening and it's been a challenge for everybody and not just our industry we're sometimes a little bit blinkered thinking it's just coaches but there's so many industries at the moment that are affected. And I think the key thing for any government now is to get on top of the energy crisis because that once you get that stabilised, well, then hopefully then it can help stabilise prices, the employment market being the cost of living. There's so much that hinges on energy, but it shows as well how reliant we are on it. And we need to look at making ourselves more and more 
self-sufficient in whichever way. Uh, and we've been reliant on relationships with um, considered allies around the globe, which then relationships like any relationship, like a marriage, you can fall out. And we've seen that now with Russia, that mm -hmm. in the late 90s, the ship was over to their very cheap gas and oil, and it was great. So we didn't need to be producing our own because we could buy it so much cheaper from abroad. And now it's on the flip side and we're paying the cost for that. Yeah, indeed. I, I was talking to a minibus manufacturer uh, only a couple of weeks ago. He said that they've had plans to fit solar panels to the roof of their um, roof of their buildings. Um, and then they'd kind of forgotten about it and then tried to rekindle it and found that um, they can't get any uh, can't get anybody to do it because they're all so busy. So it does seem that the, the message of self-sufficiency and energy is sort of got through to businesses now <coughs> and uh, and like I say solar's uh, solar's um, picking up uh, very very swiftly which is uh, not really a surprise to anyone no we have to look at all these other things solar recycling we have to look at all the different ways that we can make these savings or we can make our operations more cost effective also look at insulation not just at our home premises but actually looking at our work premises as well our offices how well insulated are they um we have a number of lights which is fitted on everyone that's got the, the low output energy saving bulbs but we've also got the motion sensors if somebody walks past in the garage you lights up they go off yeah. you've got to look at all these little things that you can do to make that little bit of saving but likewise as well our site it has to be lit up it has to have lights on when the coaches are backing up we've got the cctv so there's always power being trained we can't switch everything off at the end of the day we've got our server we've got other equipment so there's always going to be a drawer of power but it's put little things in place that you can mainly mainly manage what you're using in the interim period yeah indeed indeed and um, what in terms of in terms of the very many challenges that the uh, coach industry faces at the moment What's your what's your current focus? Is there any one issue in which you are particularly interested at the moment? It's more than one issue. I'm sorry to disappoint you. We're not just saying one. I think the labour shortage is a big problem. Again, we're, we're very blinded to that and just look at it as just coaches. But I had our CCTV, our site CCTV guys here yesterday. They do all sorts of installations, electronic doors, and he was saying the shortage of electricians. And when he goes on to plants, because they're part of a number of hospital constructions, the workforce now is sliding. He's one of the youngest that turns up on the plants, and he's 50 years old. Yeah. So it just shows we've got a real skill shortage shortage in numerous sectors. We yeah. see it if you're trying to call a, call a mechanic out. So it's not just drivers. We get het up on drivers because that's our industry. But yeah. there's lots and lots of other industries that are suffering a labour shortage. And that's something that we need to address. The concern as well is net zero. It's getting it right. And the journey to net zero, lots and lots of people are focused on. We just hear the end goal, 2040. We just hear these figures that are mentioned all the time. But what about the transition? And what about the stranded assets in between these Euro 6 vehicles that you're investing in? Now, we're coming to the next cycle of the same uh, projections for an operator can be about 10, 10 years that coach lasts within their fleet. Mm. So when you're getting a little bit to now the late 2020s, what do you order at that point? Yeah. Will that vehicle become effectively worthless? And also, what can we do now to make a difference? So I believe there's a lot of things that we can do as operators that maybe then the government's approach to our vehicles could become a lot different. One of the great things, I think, at the moment is HVO fuel. Mm. Difference that that could make. Now, I know there's restrictions of how much is available, but let's put that to one side because there is refinery, refinery capacity, but like anything, it's built on the demand they will only produce it and the more the demand is but if there was some incentive be it the essential user rebate scheme that rha can park uh, campaign for along with the other trade bodies that got behind it it was some sort of incentive that the duty was a lot lower than that type of fuel yeah. and encouraged that all haulage and coaches and buses switched over to that basically made it mandatory that he used it the climate change difference will be absolutely astronomical. 
because them fleets of vehicles that are operating all around the country will have their emissions reduced by up to 80 to in some um cases let's say 90 percent yeah, but let's, yeah. Go up, uh, um, let's be more conservative and say 75 percent that's yeah. That's a massive difference, and that's using the assets that we've got available now. So there's things that we can do that are virtually within our grasp that I think on an environmental message, the government's missing a trick. Um, operators, quite a, a number of us have been using telematics for ages. Telematics can improve efficiency, looking what sorts of oils that you put in your vehicles, the drain periods, all them sorts of things, your tire inflation, um, that's very important because again it gets you that increased MPG and one of the things that I've recently had a successful trial on and done all my fleet now all my coach fleet and going over to minibuses is a system called fuel active and fuel active delivers on our fleet it's showing an average of seven percent MPG increase which wow. equates to the same reduction in CO2 output wow. so win-win situation it's a very simple bit of technology that you're not having to connect to internet, it's not digital, it's purely analog, very simple system, designed actually for plant equipment, where they were suffering from dirty diesel in the quarries and uh, various other um, climates that were hazardous and were prone to dust and dirt. So it was designed for them, but what they actually found as well is it was improving the performance of vehicles, it was actually increasing um how much either the engine was running on diesel because plant vehicles are mainly stationary or indeed increasing the mpg so yeah. it's a fantastic system and i've already seen it delivering big results for us and by the end of the year hopefully we're going to have all our minibuses fitted to it as well um so that's a concern i think we can we can do something now to make a difference but also we got to be influencing change and how it's supplied it's all well and good to say some fantastic electric vehicles out there which are is Utong's vehicle it's fantastic and they have now worked on a mobile battery charger so they're coming up with bits of solutions but we need more than that we need these charging points around the country we need to look at these areas um what's accessible what's not are we going to have a mix of hydrogen is it just going to be electric there's still a lot of work to do and that's where I think joy forces with the RHA, uh, which there is a hell of a lot more trucks on the road than coaches and buses combined. Um, the technology that's going to be used in coaches will be influenced by what goes in trucks. So why don't we have that perfect synergy? This time we can, the loudest voice will be the RHA and encourage other trade bodies to put aside any differences all get involved and all come out with the same message for the coaching industry and get behind the loudest voice, which on this one has got to be the RHA because they represent the haulage industry. So what works for haulage is going to be default, something that's for the coach industry as well. Yeah. So we've got to make sure and my responsibility as chairman and our board is as well is to make sure we're getting that message across that we're representing the coach industry as well as the haulage sector. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I echo all those thoughts as well about uh, alternative fuels. Um, HVO, a lot of operators may not, well, some operators may not be familiar with it, but it's um, hydro-treated vegetable oil, and uh, the emissions are lowered because the plants that created it originally absorbed CO2 from the atmosphere, so therefore they're only releasing what they've already absorbed. It's not fossil fuel, in other words, isn't it? That's the, that's the issue, really. We're already seeing um, there is certain clients that are now apparently asking for this, especially in the events sector. Mm -hmm. I was speaking to a haulier that provides all the trucks KB events and provide them for Ed Sheeran and, and various other artists. And they want to see sustainable transport plans and environmentally friendly plans. And so they have switched their trucks to HVO. Wow. Uh, yeah. They've said they've not really noticed any running differences at all. The only thing is currently at the moment, I think it's about 20 odd pence a litre dearer, yeah. so, but they're able to pass it on to the end user. Um, but you can see there's an answer there that would help to help uh, not so much resolve the climate change issues, but would help to um, make a big difference within our industries anyway. And that's within our grasp. And I think that's something that we can go out and reach. 
long term we've got to make sure that we're driving for getting the message across making sure the right infrastructure is in place um because we did see the crazy scenario of one of the coaches um that went to the g7 summit that was nothing to charge it with and then you're hearing stories as well how reliable they were or not i don't know about diesel chargers having to go up to cop 26 to charge electric vehicles some of the vans and stuff that were on the event so there's a long way to go yet so yeah focus this focus of just looking at the end goal it's all well and good but let's look at the here and now and this transition period and how can we work with the existing technology the existing fossil fuels that we were using to make sure that they're not polluting or we're reducing our carbon footprint now and i think we can do that and i've shown that the technology is there anyway that we can do little things that give us them look percentages and make a big difference yeah no i echo that um as you say it's the it's the same rules they apply to racing cars, isn't it? You knock off 2% here and 2% there, and eventually you've got 15%, and that's worth having. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how does um, the next six months look for the RH, uh, for RHA coaches, do you think? What's the, um, uh, what, what, presumably you're still on, you're still pressing for new members? You'd like some more members to join? Yeah. Always open to new members join us. There's been lots of conversations, lots of operators watching from the wings that have been speaking to myself, speaking to Andy, speaking to other members, like what we're doing, like what we're about, and actually like the services that we're able to offer um, our members as well. Yeah. Um, because that's the big thing. If you can have little things that make a big difference in your operation during the day, and most co coach operators generally fleets about 10 to 15, they're not gonna have a HR department, but if you've got somebody at the end of the telephone line that can get help you with your HR inquiries, they're not gonna have contacts in DVLA, but RHA do when they can check your driving license within 24 hours if it's a medical issue. Yeah. Their little things are the win, plus also then the savings that you can make because they have a number of partner um, suppliers that are branded as RHA, so the true tech um, analysts, that's also RHA. It's exactly the same equipment, micro ice, and you get very good deal by going direct to RHA as well. So there's a number of different products out there that you can source through RHA and they all make them savings. So if you add up a few hundred pounds on this, your fuel card's a little bit cheaper, M6 toll tags where you can get a little bit discount on as well. Again, all these little things make a big difference to your day-to-day -day operation. And that's an important thing. Anybody that engages with the trade body, they need to look what can it deliver for their business and how it can potentially make things just that little bit easier for their day-to-day -day operation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we, um, within uh, on that subject, um, are, are there any ways in which um, prospective RHA members, can, RHA coaches members can uh, dip into a meeting or, or, or see what you do sort of firsthand? Yeah, we're looking again. Uh, we held a number of open uh, webinars, if you remember, um, and they went down very well. And we're looking about opening some of them up again and doing a little bit of the story so far, what RHA has been up to, where we're heading and getting that messaging across. And probably the time is getting right now to do the next series. We're always open to people speaking to us. I know Andy has spoke to many, many operators over the past six or 12 months, giving advice, not RHA members, but we're here to help the coach industry. So we're not going to turn uh, close the door on anybody. Yeah. Um, if, if they want help, if you have advice, get in touch with us. Yeah, well, do, do let us know about the webinars as well. We'll make sure that, is, uh, that we have notice of them in the magazine or on, online. So everybody Absolutely. can join in. How's, how, are, how, are things at, uh, how are things at Anthony's uh, these days? Um, it's been a busy summer it's been a very busy summer it's been um it's been a challenge in two years to say the least i never would have thought we rewind the clock to 2020 that i would be on bbc politics live and speaking to baroness fear and all these weird and wonderful things but that's the way the industry has took us it's great to see the industry has picked back up again and it's fantastic when i see other coach operators doing well who would have thought this 18 months ago? It seemed to be one long saga that wasn't going away. Um, Anthony's travel, we've always had the uh, benefit of good foundations and the fact that we've been trading for so long. So we were able to weather the COVID storm probably a little bit better than 
some other operators, uh, mainly because we were doing essential contracts all throughout them periods as well. So even in the peak of lockdown, we were still half operational, to which I always remain very thankful and very humble that we had that work. Moving on now, bookings have been through the roof. Um, yeah inquiries maybe a little bit of a pent up demand because people haven't been going to these events before and they've all been cancelled 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 confidence is higher now um we face some of the same um problems that um other operators face that maybe you've not had the pool of drivers available that you used to once have although we're finding that we can work smarter it's not so much work harder it's work smarter and it's getting the best value out of vehicles uh, at the time where we can maximize the staff so at one time we used to be quite concerned if we didn't have the fleet out on a saturday now because the trading model is slightly adjusted over time it doesn't really matter if not all out because if we're getting the right value on some of the other hires that we're doing and we're able to make the right efficiency savings as well we're actually seeing the bottom line go up 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 up, up instead of going down because we're not being busy fools the important thing is to work, is to work smart work hard but work smart as well yeah absolutely i hear the same from other other quality operators like uh, anthony's travel i'm sure there are a lot of uh, operators out there who found a very similar thing thankfully prices have firmed up a little bit and there's really no need to to go all out for um, on price to to win work which is uh, one of the small benefits of the industry having shrunk slightly over the period of the um, over the period of uh, the uh, coronavirus epidemic, so a uh, pandemic. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a strange bonus to have, but it, it does seem to have um, affected business that way. We're also with the uh, with the cost of living crisis, with inflation, it's very well known that costs are going up. Yeah. So at one point, you used to really struggle to go back to a, cl a client and yeah. put a higher up even uh, a minimal amount, five or ten pounds. Now, you pretty much accept it because they've read in the papers, it's all over the news that costs are rising. So long as you're not taking advantage of the situation, you are able to increase your prices and maybe start getting round about the margins that coach operators should have been for their investment. Because it's a very hard industry. It's yeah. a great industry, but it's very challenging you've got to love the industry if you're a coach operator you know there's many bald coach operators out there that have probably been tearing the hair out at night you know there wasn't a, um it's a tough industry to be in at times so it's right that we're starting to see um getting the rates that are right for the investment and the time that it's taken for these quality operators and it's great to see lots of coaches out there again and you mentioned before about the funeral one of our members, Grange Travel, was on it. I seen pictures of their flight. I thought, what, fant what a fantastic yeah. advert for the coach industry. Um, and it shows, and if it's good enough for dignitaries, and if it's good enough for royalty, or well, certainly coach travel, then it's good enough for everybody, isn't it? It is indeed. Well, look, um, thanks for that. Really appreciate it, Richard. Um, it's always good to talk, which is a, also a great recommendation for joining any trade association, as you say, I think pick the one that suits you, but um, the value for money from trade associations is still there and and those messages that need to get across still need to go. It's really good to see that Baron SV has stood in post, so at least we've got a bit of continuity from transport ministers, which they usually change as often as they change their trousers. So rather good to see that Baron SV is still there. We may not be, some operators may not be a greatest fan, but that kind of continuity means that we can, you know, work on the messaging, yeah? Well, a period of over the last 24 months, Baroness Fear has certainly been educated about coaching industry by myself, by numerous other coach operators as well. So that's good. So she does understand the industry a lot better than she did two or three years ago. So it can only be a good thing. We need to build on that and move forward. And a funny little story about Baroness Fear is one of my meetings with her, I was asked to attend a meeting along with Gray Vidler of CPT and there was a couple of people from dft on the call um so yeah i was quite happy to accept uh, i stood in last minute i got in touch with rha and rha said well we'll arrange a pre-meet for you and we'll give you a couple of little tips of maybe what to mention right so i've got rob mckenzie on the call i've got paul mumbry and i've got some of their policy team so they're going through that's actually saying to me what do you want to mention richard and that's one thing rha are very good at they don't tell you what to say they want to go with your messaging 
So then I was after some suggestions and Rob said, you must mention COP26. Now, at that time, I thought he was on about a box set on Sky. I thought, <laughs> why are we on about a TV programme? I actually knew this environmental event was going on in Scotland, mm. but this was about six, eight months before, but I didn't know its tagline. And he said, you must mention that. And I slipped into conversation with Baroness Veer, and it was very emotive. Emo you know, it's what's of current and what's emotive to an MP. And yeah. when I mentioned COP26, it was like a light bulb moment for her. Yeah. And then she started mentioning it, and you say, yes, Richard, you're right. So it's important to tap into them things. So, yeah, yeah, it's good that Baroness Veer is still here. I know she's a bit of a controversial character, especially in the coaching industry, because coaching industry didn't get the bespoke help that we hoped that we would. But what's done is done. It's about driving the industry forward and making sure that she's aware of what the coach industry is doing in the future. Well, thanks very much for that, Richard. I um, really appreciate it. I always know I get a good conversation out of you when I call. Um, <laughs> Keep banging the drum for our RHA coaches. Um, you couldn't be, a, a, they couldn't have a finer chairman in place. Oh, thank you. Um, thank so, you. Uh, I, I know you're going to make a great difference to it. So, uh, yeah, have a great day, Richard, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you, sir. Take care.